Hello. Hi. I made some mistakes in the previous Little Guys episode, and there were enough of them that I figured I'd just make a video clearing them all up. Uh, so let's just start at the top. I said uh, this power supply was probably, like, uh, purchased with a, a normal connector on the end, and, uh, you know, whoever built this thing just cut it off and, and put this on there. Literally, literally has a diagram right on it that shows the special Phoenix connector. Like, it, it was definitely manufactured this way, and... Uh, I guess I just tuned it out because I'm so used to seeing normal polarity diagrams and I'm also so used to seeing these things with, with just like a normal plug on them. I mean, to wit, I got like five or six more of these kicking around somewhere and almost every single one of them just has a 2.5 millimeter barrel jack on it, which is really funny because I did absolutely just grab three of these that have these uh, <laughs> locking collars on them, so... Even that's a bad example. Anyway, the point is, I just tuned it out because I'm not a very smart man. Another thing that's not a big deal at all, but I just thought was funny, is how many comments I got that, in fact, Coinstar machines do exist in the UK and you know various European countries. Because I put out the original video on Patreon, and then I got all these people saying, like, I've never seen one of these, never heard one of these, they sound horrifying. Uh, so I decided to add that little addendum uh, to the video before I released it. Uh, and then got a whole bunch of people going, no, they're not just a U.S. thing, what are you talking about? So, there's no winning with these things. I guess five seconds of research, however, probably could have helped. I don't know. I could have asked the internet. Although, I guess in a sense, I pretty much did. Okay, but let's move on to much more important things. Uh, remember how the whole premise at the end of the video was, I wonder if you can run audio over the DVI port? I never tested it. I was so tired by the end of the process that I just never tested it. Uh, and for some reason, when I edited the video, it just, uh, I don't know, it slipped my mind. Like, I noticed, hey man, you never tested it, but I just didn't do anything about it. So, let's let's do something about it. Uh, I've got an HDMI to DVI adapter here. I, I guess that's how you'd do it, right? Now, it's powering up, we're not getting any video, uh, but this actually happened before, uh, if you recall, we didn't get any video during the uh, the whole post sequence. Uh, I only got it once I got into Windows, and then switched from uh, VGA over to straight DVI, so it's possible that it's just still booting right now. Um, the machine is on, I'm getting the numlock. I should mention, by the way, when I was editing the original video, I did have this thought, what if we never actually got a digital picture out of this? because it does have the VGA pins on the DVI connector. So what if the monitor I was using, which was this very versatile Dell monitor that does every format under the sun, uh, actually noticed that the VGA signal was present and not the DVI and just picked that up. But I took another look at the cable I was using because I have seen some that have the extra uh, four pins here for the VGA, but this one doesn't. This is digital only, and besides that, I don't think any monitor in the world would actually do what I just described. That would be weird. Although part of me is wondering if my HDMI is even plugged in. No. God damn it. I am not a smart man. <laughs> All right. Big money. Oh, is this turned up? No, it is not. Again, with the not smart. Still not getting anything. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was the, uh, the onboard audio output. We're not actually set to the display. Uh, and you know what? It does say Intel Display Audio and the name of the TV, LCD TV. So, hey, there it is. Wow, that actually worked. And and I, I guess it makes sense. You know, I, I don't see why it wouldn't. If the DVI port is able to operate in HDMI mode, then yeah, this isn't the least bit shocking. But uh, all the same, I can't believe I forgot to do it the first time around. <laughs> And I have no idea why there's a test vids directory on the desktop. I put all these together for that uh, that little Sony Vio laptop that I was messing with. I don't remember putting them on here or why I would have put them on here, but... This is one of the least interesting looking laptops I've seen in my entire life. And a sentence like that is how you know you're watching Quick Start. Okay, yeah, to no one's surprise, it works perfectly. But let's move on to new business, because there's a much bigger mistake that I need to correct before somebody else <laughs> screws it up the same way I did. So, when I took this thing apart, I pulled the heatsink off, and then I had a clip of me scraping the old compound off the CPU. 
A couple people were upset that I used a metal tool to do that, but I know what I'm doing, and to wit, I didn't damage anything, so I don't think I have anything to apologize for there, but yeah, technically, if you're not 100% confident, you should probably not do that. Use a plastic tool. You're less likely to cause damage if you slip with it, but the bigger problem is I scraped all that compound off, commented on how it was, you know, horrible and old and dried out, and then I put some Arctic Silver 5 on there. And I quipped about how the AS5 was conductive, and a couple other people thought that as well, uh, but then a couple more people informed me that no, it isn't. And sure enough, if you go to their website, it explicitly says that it's not conductive, so I don't know why I thought it was. The bigger problem, though, is that later in the video, when I take the heat sink off again, you can see that the compound hasn't touched the heat sink at all. Like it's just sitting there in its original state. So this thing is probably running with absolutely no cooling right now as we speak, uh, because as a couple people explained, the compound that was on there originally was probably a kind of a thermal wax, as one person put it, which is explicitly intended to fill gaps. I had commented on how odd it was uh, that the heat sink had no like spring mechanism on it, that it was just held on by these hard standoffs, uh, because it seems surprising to me that the uh, the tolerances on that could actually be you know, close enough for this to work. Well, they probably aren't, right? There probably is actually like a half millimeter gap in there, one millimeter gap, something like that. And the compound was supposed to fill that. So since I put a thin uh, little bead of Arctic Silver on there, the heat sink is probably not touching anything at the moment. Now there's a few different ways to solve this. And I frankly just got a bit overwhelmed trying to figure out what the recommended approach was. Uh, but I did see a few people out there saying that you can use just like a silicone thermal pad for this. Like, I'm sure it wouldn't work on like a super high end, you know, like i9 that's uh, putting out like 280 watts. But I suspect that for the, the little dinky chip in here, any old thermal pad would probably do. So I just grabbed some crap and we're going to find out if that's true. Uh, I've got some owl tree uh, color pink. Uh, I've got some ox lumv. No color on that. No, there we go. Colored gray. Uh, and then we have some Frenda. Do not separate. Uh, that's all we know. By the way, this is this is incredibly heavy, like much, much heavier than the other two. So I have no idea what I've purchased here necessarily um, or whether any of these are actually going to work. They're actually intended, I think, mostly for like, you know, NVMEs and um, like GPU uh, VRMs and memory chips and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't know. I, they'll probably be fine for this application. I just have to figure out what fits because I don't know what the gap in there actually is. So I'm going to start with the uh, the thinnest pad that I've got here. And uh, we're just going to like uh, run some tests, see what temperature the CPU comes up to. It's probably sitting there throttling as we speak. Uh, and then we'll uh, put a pad in there and see if it gets any better. Of course, obviously, we've got to start by getting a baseline. So let's see if we can figure out what the temps are right now. It's going to be really funny if it turns out that the thing is not overheating at all. Well, sitting at idle, it certainly doesn't look like it's doing too bad. Uh, the core is sitting at 36C right now, which is perfectly reasonable. And yeah, it may be idling, but with literally no cooling whatsoever, not even a heat spreader, this should be hotter than that. Oh, you know what? There actually is uh, an entry here that just says whether the CPU is thermal throttling, and this says no, no, no. So I wonder if I actually was right and and maybe the, the compound is working uh, or if uh, the Core i3 is just that good at thermal control, I don't know. Let's um let's give it a load and see what happens. <laughs> the stress test program I just launched uh, just allocated all memory, so Windows just freaked out about it. We'll just um we'll just put that over there. Now let's see if we've maxed out the CPU. Oh yes. Yes we have. Okay, with the CPU completely maxed, we are hitting, ooh, 97C. That, um, that doesn't seem right. I'm kind of surprised, actually, that it's not saying it's throttling because I'm pretty sure that's too damn hot. But we can see from the effective clocks up here, that is uh, 2.1 gigahertz. So, no, I don't think it's throttling. According to Intel Arc, the uh, maximum junction temperature is 105C, which is exactly what this is stopping at. Like, we could presume that's 104.9. Oh, there we go. Thermal throttling. Yes, it just had to, it had to hit that limit. So there we go. Congratulations. You were right. I screwed up. I mean, what else is new? Let's, uh, let's fix this thing.
Yeah, that's uh, that's dead cold. It might have cooled off by now, but mm, nah, there should be some residual heat if that was getting anything. Oh, uh, before I take that out, I just want to comment on something else. Uh, I had said in the video that I thought that this uh, hard drive caddy was kind of strange because it had a hole in it. And a number of people said that that's because that's the spot on a uh, like a spinning disc where the motor would be. But I don't think that's actually true. Yeah, the, uh, the hole is down there, but I've got some... Uh, laptop size drives here this one's this one doesn't really count this is a seagate 10k it's too thick to go in pretty much any laptop it's actually a sas drive but um just for the record you know that has no exposed spindle at all but uh, i've got a more realistic one here this is a hitachi and it's got the spindle up at the other end of the tray and i think that is typically where it is but besides that it just wouldn't really even matter because the drive doesn't sit flat against this part of the tray you see how it's got these uh these little dips here, those act like standoffs. They space the drive off from the plate. So even if you had a laptop drive that had a, a motor spindle sticking out down there, there's no way it would ever contact it. So I still have absolutely no idea what that hole is for. That's what she said. All right, let's see the ugliness. Okay, I can already tell there's no contact between the two because it's just moving around freely. And when we take this off, it, yeah, okay. So it did manage to touch it at some point, but that's obviously not right. It should have uh, uh, pressed out a lot more than that. Uh, but clearly it was just the tips of each of the blobs that were contacting. Uh, I mean, that's probably why it didn't immediately overheat. Like if I had literally nothing on there, I don't think this thing would have made it to a desktop because uh, without even having a heat spreader, uh, I think the cores would have hit 105 and the machine would have just shut down it would have gone beyond throttling and just turned itself off suffice to say clearly you were right i screwed up uh let's let's do better so i have no idea how thick the pad needs to be i'm guessing not very because after all my uh my grease did contact just not very much so i've got several different sizes here i haven't even looked at these yet i don't even know if they are what they say they are Oh, okay, yeah, that's a thermal pad, although it looks pretty thick. That seems like overkill to me. Like, obviously, I would have to cut it down to begin with, but it feels like this would probably get too compressed. It's got like a little protective plastic layer on this side. Okay, let's put this guy on there and see if it feels like it's being compressed. Pretty much uh, the same material that this thing has on top uh, that connects it to the uh, external heat sink, but that is definitely too thick. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's quite a lot of space between the standoff and the uh, motherboard. If I were to screw that down, it would have to compress the hell out of that pad. So let's see if I have a thinner one. This is the two millimeter. So I think we want the one millimeter. Is that this? Ah, this contains one millimeter and 1.5 millimeter options, and it's pink, so let's give that a shot. All right, so that's the one milli, that's the 1.5 milli, but eh, that's not that much thinner. I think I'm going to go with the one, and we'll see what that looks like. I recommend you do not duplicate anything I'm doing. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. I haven't read about this, anything like that. I'm just completely winging it. The texture of this stuff is so miserable. It feels like, um, it's like, it's like handling lunch meat, but worse. All right, let's see how that sits on there. Ooh, okay. Oh, that feels much better. Uh, it's definitely contacting. There is a tiny bit of space down there, but not much. And I think I could compress that safely. So let's throw a couple screws in there, see how that feels. Uh, as far as I can tell, these pads don't really come any thinner than this. So if uh, one millimeter is too thick, then my only real choice would be to go with uh, some sort of compound instead. Ooh, so that does have to compress a little bit, but it doesn't feel too bad. Uh, I imagine that if you put enough force on, on a CPU die, even through a pad, at some point you can still damage it, but definitely that much force ain't gonna do it. All right, well, I'm feeling a lot better about that, so let's uh, get this thing buttoned up and give it another try. Oh, one more thing I was gonna say. 
Uh, somebody pointed out that potentially this SATA connector here, uh, which I, I couldn't see any function for, might be for putting a drive on the bottom of the board, but that doesn't seem likely. There's too much stuff in the way. All these uh, standoffs, these are all permanent. And given that the CPU is right here, I, I don't think it would be possible to have a design where that wasn't the case. I think the presence of this great big via here, which is where we see these um, these standoffs pressed in normally, uh, suggests that they had some format for an SSD that would have been only this big. There are also things called uh, disk on modules that just hang directly off a SATA port. And so this might've been for one of those and the, the standoff is totally irrelevant. Uh, but in any case, it definitely wouldn't go on the bottom. All right, hopefully it turns back on. All right, let's take a look at our new temps. Probably the same at idle, I would guess. Oh, actually, no, that knocked a solid 10 degrees off the core temps. Absolutely shocking news here uh, for everyone, but if you run a CPU with literally no cooling whatsoever, you're always going to have higher temperatures. I don't think anybody could have predicted this. So now let's load it down. All right, the CPU is now slammed and our temperatures are at uh, 47, 47, 47, 48, there we go, yeah. This is uh, definitely, definitely more what it should look like. After a couple minutes, we've gotten up to 62C, but uh, that's still pretty reasonable. I don't know if these are the temps that it should have, you know, maybe uh, with the right thermal pad, it would be running a lot better. But my experience with these things, wrong as it often is, is that in most cases, something is 95% better than nothing. And then after that, you just get marginal improvements. Uh, you know, if you've got like an AMD Epic with 72 cores that puts out like 500 watts TDP and you run it with no compound whatsoever, yeah, it's gonna throttle instantaneously and then probably die, not a whole lot later. Uh, but if you put literally anything on there, like, uh, like this stuff, <laughs> uh, StarTech Heat Grease 20. Why is it called that? Because the most important thing about this is that it's 20 grams. <laughs> when the volume of your compound is a flagship feature, you know you got the good stuff. Uh, I think the package for this says, um, uh, improves heat conduction through use of a silicone compound. <laughs> so <laughs> this is about as, uh, as basic as it gets. And um, when I first got this stuff, I squeezed some out and I immediately saw like oil separation. So I'm like, well, I'm never using that on anything. But if you put this on your AMD Epic 500 watt, it's probably gonna survive. It might run much warmer than it should, but it's probably gonna work. Now, if you put some $60 gamer compound on there, liquid metal, phase change pads, something like that, yeah, you're gonna drop some degrees off the temperature for sure, but you could probably get 95% of the performance out of the thing by using heat grease 20, improves thermal conduction through use of a silicone compound. Oh, and you know what? One more thing, I admit I screwed this up. The thing on the end of a shoelace isn't called a ferrule, it's called an aglet. And as much as I wanna say that an aglet is a subtype of a ferrule, as far as I can tell, that's not true. It has, uh, I think, a distinct etymology. I'm just wrong about that, okay? It's the same concept, more or less. Uh, I figured it was a good analogy, but uh, apparently those are not literally called ferrules. Oh, and somebody also asked uh, if the pinout on this plug is universal for these things. I think it's uh, positive, ground, negative. The answer is no. There's a lot of little guys that use this exact same plug, but in every single possible permutation. I've got like ground, negative, positive. I've got positive, negative, ground. Uh, sometimes it's like positive, power on ground. So so like that's where you attach your uh, remote power control switch. It's, it's all over the place. They all use this plug. Um, sometimes four pins, sometimes three pin, but there's no telling what pin out it's gonna be. So you gotta check every single time. I hate it. At least though, because it is a screw connector, you could just reconfigure it on the fly. You know what, since I'm making corrections, I went back to my comments and found a couple other things worth mentioning. Uh, one person who works with these things says that the digital IO ports, uh, the optocouplers on there, are designed to take voltages as high as 48 in most cases. So my specific example was not a very good one. Uh, it's designed for protecting more against very, very high voltages and, and other unusual circumstances, but uh, they realistically probably would take 
48. And yet another person pointed out that there's another function of the optocoupler that might be even more important than rejecting high voltage, which is that it also rejects digital noise that might be imposed on the ground inside the machine. If this was an electrical connection and you were using it in like an environment with heavy EMI, or you just had something connected to it that was really noisy internally, uh, you could get noise coupled onto the, um, uh, the ground inside the machine but here, because it's an optical interface, that's impossible. You can get noise on the signal itself, theoretically, but it's not going to affect the functioning of the rest of the computer, if I understood them correctly. And then one more thing, this is the final thing this time, I, I promise, for real. Every time I bring this thing out in a video, I'm gonna have to summarize what it is so I don't get thousands of comments every single time. This is the IODD ST400, I usually just call it IOD, and uh, it's part of a series of devices from this company. I don't think anybody else makes anything like it and they're all uh, USB disk emulators. If I open this up here, uh, I've just got an SSD in here. I loaded that up with ISO images, um, floppy images, uh, VHD hard disk images, and then when you plug it in, you could come in here and select those images uh, from the, uh, the built-in menu here, and then it shows up in Windows as that device. So it appears to be um, a Blu-ray drive here. Uh, well, this is exciting. I think, uh, I think the machine just died for some reason. Not getting anything on the keyboard here. Well, that's concerning. I have no idea what just happened. Let's uh, reboot the computer. It'd be really funny if it died at the very end of the video after stress testing at a very reasonable temperature. I think it was at like 62 C before this happened. So I, I don't think it overheated or anything, but uh, I don't seem to be getting any life from it. So let's uh, power cycle. Well, I think I killed it. D what? Okay, now it's working again. Oh, yeah, it looks like uh, it probably blue screened uh, because a volume manager says crash dump initialization failed. And that happened right after I connected the IOD. Oh, my gosh. You know what probably happened? Uh, remember how there was that um, that memory utilization warning sitting on the screen saying there was no RAM left? I'll bet it had nowhere to put the driver for this thing. So uh, it just crashed instead. Let's um reconnect it and see if it works this time. Yeah, that uh, that looks better. So anyway, I'll eventually do a video about these things because uh, they are extremely cool. It's exactly what I said it was. It's it's literally just an optical drive emulator uh, that runs off an SSD. So if we come in here and hit that, bam, I just put in a Win DVD disc. Uh, and it's a little more fiddly to work with other stuff. Like theoretically, you can load VHD files and they're supposed to show up um, as if they're a distinct hard drive. Um, but I've had a lot of trouble getting that to work. There's supposed to be some method where you can take like um, a bootable USB drive image and convert it directly into a VHD, which is what I was trying to do here. Um, that didn't work and it's a pretty arcane process. So I need to put some more effort into uh, figuring out how that functions. Also, I've heard this thing can emulate a floppy drive, but um, I tried that and I don't think I had any success with it. So there are nits I would pick about this product, but it's it's honestly terrific, and I recommend everybody get one who can afford one because it's essentially eliminated the process of um, you know writing out USB drives and then having to later rewrite them with something else. I literally bought um, this many drives, the, the cheapest ones I could get, solely to put like you know Windows and and Linux ISOs on, and I don't have to do any of that crap anymore. Uh, I can just put them all on here. So yeah. Great product. Anyway, I know that was a little bit disjointed, um, but I'm trying to do these off the cuff videos uh, just to, to sort of bring you more into the process. You know, I re everything that I've ever released in the history of my channel up until recently has been like, uh, you know, a heavily polished, refined thing that was as good as I could get it. And I'm just so tired of it. And I know everybody else would like to see more of what's going on with me, you know, behind the scenes anyway. So I figured you'd enjoy uh, just getting an update for once instead of just, um, you know, me writing my corrections in the description under the video. I feel like nobody ever reads them. Um, I don't necessarily blame you. The YouTube UI is not the best, but I really would like to start publishing more, you know, corrections and retractions. It's, it's sort of the responsible thing to do. So this was a functional necessity, but I hope it was also entertaining. Uh, I did my best. Uh, if you enjoyed this, then consider supporting me on Patreon as well, uh, like all these people are doing, because that's how I can afford to keep buying these little guys. Although a lot of people have been sending me little guys, and I'm really happy about that. As I suspected when I started this series, an awful lot of people have things like this sitting around their homes. 
my advice to you is if you do and you want to get rid of it, send me an email. I have said yes to almost every single one I've been offered. I've got an entire enormous plastic bin full of these things, but I need more. I want more. Keep them coming. I'll keep making episodes as long as I have devices uh, to make them about. Uh, you can email me, by the way. A lot of people don't seem to notice my email address in the about page for my channel. It's just cathoderaydude at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to just send me a picture of whatever you got, and uh, I'll let you know if I'm interested. But these things do still show up locally, and I find them on eBay and stuff, and I just have to buy them for money. So I'm still incredibly grateful to everybody supporting me on Patreon for making that possible. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.